We're going to get started, um, so grab uh, some more of yours and, and grab your seat if you could. We want to make plenty of time for conversation and um, we want to get to introducing you to our uh, special guests tonight. So just to kick off, um, I'm Michelle Freeman and I'm one of the co-hosts of Urban Consulate here in Philadelphia. I also um, run a civic-minded um, marketing and events company here in Philly. Um, uh, Urban Consulate is really about trying to connect more people across cities and also to, to connect like-minded people in Philly together to talk about different city issues. So um, I was just telling a couple people here that we just got back from a Detroit field trip where we brought a group of 10 Philadelphians to Detroit during Detroit Design Festival and had them share some of their work around public space and community engagement. So um, just um, uh, hosting dinners like this, hosting a monthly salon series, all different types of topics. Um, we have a, an event during Design Philly next week called uh, Tactical Urbanism. We'll, we'll, sh we'll showcase um, a handful of citizen-led uh, projects, and we also have a special guest from Detroit, uh, from Detroit Creative Corridor, uh, Melinda, coming in from Detroit and speaking at, a, at that as well. So if you do want more information or anything like that, we have some cards here with our website, and you can also leave your email address in this book if you want us to uh, notify you about future programs. Um, what else was I supposed to say? So we have um, Eric from the Tribune, and then Meredith who has um, been capturing all of our conversations uh, on video that we've been having uh, from month to month. So um, we just wanted to, to let you know that they're here and they're our guests. And um, if you like to tweet, you should tweet and you can feel free to use um, at Urban Consulate. Um, but, um, and I think that's all my housekeeping. Bathrooms are down to the hall if you've seen them to the right. And, um, and we're so happy that you're all here. So thank you so much. And thanks to Eat Cafe. Valerie, do you want to say, not to put you on the spot, do you want to just yeah, maybe well, let people know though about what's up with the cafe? So what I will do is introduce uh, Marianne Chilton, who was the heart and soul behind the cafe. And um, unfortunately, she's got another job <laughs> as a professor, so she had to hire me. <laughs> I'll stand with you while you talk about the cafe. Hi everybody, welcome to the E-Cafe. We're so delighted that you're here. Um, we started this, uh, the idea for the cafe many years ago, over five years ago, and um, we are uh, housed at Drexel University, a center for hunger free communities. And we wanted to make a place that was in the community where people could come and really enjoy a meal together, lots of really good dialogue, um, and be able to pay what they can. We wanted to be a place where there, we can break down a lot of the barriers between race, ethnicity, social class, ability to pay, um, and to really create sort of a, a cultural and a social mashup, a political mashup. And so this is just a wonderful event to be hosting. Uh, and we're delighted that you're here. And if you want to say anything else, Ms. Valerie, did I miss anything? Uh, the only thing I want to say is take a minute and look at your menu because we're going to come around and take your entree next. <laughs> I know, is that romantic or what? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your time here and please let your friends know. Tell your friends, get it out on social media, help us with our cause and help people to understand that not only is there a beautiful, a beautiful uh, mission and a lot of a sense of, a strong sense of justice and rootedness in the community, but also that the food is awesome. So you're welcome. Thank you so much, and thanks again for hosting us today. Uh, you're really welcome. <laughs> I'm going to go turn off the music. <laughs> okay, thank you. Really? So... <laughs> <laughs> you can have music. Oh, well, I can't. <laughs> Risa, wait, where's Risa? Do, do I need music? Uh, so before I pass it off to our uh, Justice Legal Initiative, a program of the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia, organizer of Soil Generation, a diverse body of urban agriculture advocates and food justice activists who help inform policy and provide community education and support to gardeners in the city. Noel Warford, Warford sorry, um, is the executive director of Urban Tree Connection and holds a BA in women's 
Studies and Black Studies from Denison University, and a Master's in Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining UTC, she gained extensive experience managing and evaluating community-based programs at Congresso and is an adjunct faculty member at Harcombe College. And Dwayne Morton serves as the Director of External Affairs for the Food Trust, where he supports the organization's health equality, policy, and advocacy efforts, local and national partnerships, and more. He's a former Peace Corps volunteer, serves on the board of the Kennett Sorry. Foundation. <laughs> that why is throwing me off. Um, Philanthropy Network of Greater Philadelphia and Bridging the Gaps Community Health Internship Program. And he's an appointed member of the Philadelphia Food Policy Advocacy Council and the Mayor's Commission on African American Males. Is that last one the one? What was it, what did you? What was the appointment you just got recently? That. Uh, RWF Health. Well, congratulations. I'm going to pass it over, and uh, again, thanks everybody and enjoy. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, so, Claire uh, Nelson is uh, the woman who runs Urban Consulate, and I met her in Detroit a few years ago, and I also met Michelle, and we were quite surprised to find two Philly people in Detroit. Um, hanging out and that we had like 200 friends in common but had never crossed paths before um, and since then we've stayed connected in lots of different ways um, and I'm happy to see that the urban consulate concept has grown it's this initiative between great cities of Detroit and Philly and New Orleans and folks get together and have really great conversations about civic life, civic engagement, and how can we make cities uh, a thriving and equitable place for everyone. Um, so I've done some other things in the past and I've been trying to stay as connected as possible to that work uh, that Urban Council is doing. And this idea about having a conversation around food um, came up. And you know, I've been to other events, they've been at like hotels and other public spaces, but just thinking about, you know, if it's a food-centered event, what you know, this is the perfect place for it. So an institution that has, you know, opened in a community that is rooted in trying to advance something larger than the bottom line, um, which is really important, that really doesn't shy away from leaning into the issues around race and class, and we thought this was the great venue to do that. On top of that, um, I admire and respect the two women to my left. Um, these human beings are incredible in many ways, and my work in the food trust early on did not lead me to intersect with them, but we've been intentional in, in about finding ways to grow closer and closer to the work that they do and the way that they approach the work. So I thought that it would be perfect to have them accompany me on this panel and let's really you know try to dive into some conversations that happen but not normally in spaces like this um so michelle mentioned my preparation for it like i don't necessarily live in the same space um that katrina noel do but i'm very interested in it so you know i just came up with a, a series of questions to help move us through this conversation um, and hopefully that works and we'll also have some opportunity for you to be involved in some of this discussion as well because that's another thing about Urban Consulate it's about us sharing um, so I'll just jump into it right now so you know food is important for obvious reasons about sustenance but it's all you know it's about pleasure as well and it's about communion and it's about identity and the food system operates within the context of being social and political and economical and environmental and there has lots of things that are connected to it that's the issues around climate change and, and our place in it um, the cost of healthy foods and the overabundance of unhealthy cheaper foods how we waste it how people are hungry how diet related disease is ravaging underserved communities um, how the monetization and the corporatization of food and the patenting of seeds, um, the loss of small farmers in our culture and more. So all of this stuff is super complex. Um, so the question I'm gonna pose to you is like there are lots of problems related to the food system um, and they're a direct result of conventional industrial approaches tied to capitalism. 
And you know, capitalism is inextricably tied to exploitation of labor, of folks of color, it's tied to race and class. So this event tonight is not about just food and race, but it's about the future of food and our fight for it. So I'd love for you to just introduce yourself and you know, talk about how you got involved in this work and really just share the great things that you're doing. So I don't have my glasses, I love you. <laughs> so I'm Katrina Baxter, and I'm a community organizer, and I do work around food and land justice. And so we will talk about land as well tonight, because that's a, that's a, a, a bottom line of, of how we can grow food, right? How do we produce food? Land is a big part of that. Um, so what I do is, um, Noelle and I work together through Soil Generation, which is our coalition of black and, it's a black and brown led coalition of, of radical growers in the city. I would say, and, um, and we've worked along to help folks get access to land in the city to, to be able to grow food, right? As well as green space and also um, policy, and also policy related issues around urban agriculture. So um, I work nationally and regionally on issues of food and land justice with um, some beautiful comrades around the country. And um, so I'm excited to be here and we're going to dig in a little bit more, but I'm going to let my comrade talk a little bit more about who she is. Hello everyone, I'm Noelle, I'm the Executive Director of Urban Tree Connection and I'm going to say a little bit about the organization because I think that sort of roots me into, into where I am now because my bio sort of told a little bit of my backstory. Um, so the reason why I appreciate being a part of Soil Generation is because it taps on some of the policy issues that we as a very grassroots neighborhood based organization can't quite get to, we don't have the capacity, but need to know about what's happening and have that within our periphery, particularly around what's happening with land. Um, and so Urban Tree Connection, I'm actually a new executive director there. Um, I'm going into my first year um, following the founder, which is always challenging. Um, but the history of our organization and work is that we were founded in the late 90s um, in the Haddington neighborhood of West Philly, which is not too far from here, right around the corner. Um, and our farm is at 53rd and Wilderson. And our work has really been rooted in reclamation of land. So to clarify, it is community members who have lived in that neighborhood for many generations, who many properties have been abandoned over the years for a number of reasons, many of times because the families can't upkeep the properties, um, reclaiming the land in their own neighborhood for community use. Um, so just want to make sure we're all clear about what that is, because sometimes that term can be used to spur on gentrification, which is not the point that I, I want to be making. Um, so reclaiming, community members reclaiming land for the purposes of meeting a community need. And over time, and, and specifically our work has been reclamation of land for greening and garden projects. Um, in 2009, we developed our food story, to say, where we established Neighborhood Foods Farm, which is at 53rd and Wild Lucing. It's a three-quarter acre farm. It was an abandoned lot that is on the interior block surrounded by the back of the neighbor's homes. And the block captains in the neighborhood um, had a vision of what that could be um, and, is, and wanted to have it as a farm. And so that farm last year produced 10,000 pounds of sustainably grown produce, um, which is quite a bit. Um, and so our aim is to have that be not just a space for food production, um, because it's more than that. We see this work as a vehicle for building community and bringing people together. But more importantly, thinking about how are we building a local food system in the neighborhood. Um, yes, there is an absence of, of a grocery store where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and food access is an important part. But I think the conversation we want to have tonight is more around food access is a sort of reformist idea within the current context that we're living in. It doesn't, bringing a supermarket to the neighborhood doesn't address who is producing the food, our connection to where that food has been made, and the environmental impacts that go along with that. And so what we want to be thinking about is how are we as community members getting closer to food production and distribution, and being able and, and really thinking about what does community self-determination look like, what does food sovereignty look like. So I just see the note about a quick break that we're going to take orders. You want to take orders? And 
their affiliation. Is that good? Sounds Just good. do a quick round round. You want to start here? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Larissa, I work at Drexel in IT, um, I'm also a community organizer in the Cobb Street neighborhood of West Philly. Uh, I'm Rich Potosky, I'm retired, I do uh, mentoring for <coughs> women-owned minority businesses uh, out of the enterprise. I'm Ann Carlin, um, uh, up until July I was the founding executive director of Fair Food. I'm Donald Haynes, I'm a landscape architect. I have um, a business with two partners here in the city. We work on mostly public um, public landscapes and um, work on, in community parks um, through the Fenton Park Park. I'm Jean Harris. Um, I'm involved with um, the Brewtown Community Garden. Um, started the tree tenders group in our neighborhood. and. I'm working with some people to try and address um, the need for a new RCO in our neighborhood. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm the programs manager for the South of South Neighborhood Association. Um, my name is Marna, and I lived in West Philadelphia and worked in the libraries all through Philadelphia and the community college of Philadelphia, but am now retired and live in Jersey. Yeah. I'm Carolyn Neely. I'm an installation artist. And Incidentally, I did something upstairs when this was a shell. <laughs> um, it's great to see it look like this. And I'm uh, a resident of Cal Village. Uh, my name is Ayana. Um, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, and um, I'm a fourth year uh, medical student at Temple. Um, I'm Anna Marie Chang. I'm an ear doctor at Thomas Jefferson University, and I have some interest in um, food as a prescription. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm a lawyer, and I'm also on the board of Urban Tree Connection. Hi, I'm uh, Liz Grimaldi. I'm the executive director of Fleischer Art Memorial, um, the country's oldest community art school, and uh, on the board of the um, hi, I'm Vita Litvak, and I manage the build programs at Fletcher Art Memorial, and I organize the community gardens in the town. Hi, my name is Maria Allison. I do um, workforce and economic inclusion at Drexel University. Hi, I'm Kathy Davis. I'm a recovering faculty member from the Delaware Valley University. <laughs> um, I'm a food scientist and nutritionist by training, and I'm trying to find a way of using my food science and nutrition training to help with Hi, I'm uh, I'm Frank Rowe. Um, I uh, teach a course at Drexel in the School of Public Health. Um, more importantly, I'm with Daphne. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my main affiliation. <laughs> Daphne and I'm with the Leo and Peggy Pierce Family Foundation and we are big fans of these organizations and <coughs> the room and a supporter of the E Cafe. Can we mention that you're founding funder for the E Cafe? Leo and Peggy Pierce Family Foundation funded this concept five years ago and helped us get to where we are now. I'm Sheila. I'm an educator here in Philadelphia at an elementary school, and I, um, at the three elementary schools that I've worked at, I've started community gardens at all three. Uh, I'm Risa, and I work with Maine at the Food Trust. Um, I primarily work on the policy level, um, a lot with getting, helping to get grocery stores into neighborhoods all around the country. Um, my name is Sonia, and I'm, I'm an IT pharmacist at Temple University placed and we'll just keep talking so um, I know you were going to jump right in um, I think you left 
you know, talking about how you're uh, a champion for local and community-based food systems and for people in communities, um, and how food sovereignty is so important. I don't know if you wanted to pick it up from there, or we can talk to you. Well, yeah, what is your next Yeah, so we're talking about like race and how racial inequality, oppression, uh, social imbalance is reflected all throughout our community. So it's an underinvestment that has historical roots, it has structural roots, um, and we see that reflected in the food environment. So, you know, not having access to quality, healthy foods, having an overabundance uh, and dependence on corner stores, which in itself aren't bad, but that really are not offering lots of healthy alternatives. Um, you know, in Philadelphia, plenty of hoagie shops and take out Chinese food stores. Um, and we depend on these restaurants in our communities to get our nutrition. And as a result, it leaves us sicker. Um, so some of the data is that, you know, for African American, 48% of the population are obese, compared to 33% of whites, and 35% of African American children are overweight. And, you know, there is a lot of effort to increase healthy food access in communities, and we even have like online systems now, but the prediction of this kind of two-class food system, one in which wealthy, affluent folks are able to eat local, organic, healthy products, and the alternative is that poor people who are getting system, getting food from a system which perpetuates poverty and low wages and low quality of food. So talk to us about your efforts to improve the food environment in neighborhoods um, that need it. Um, and let's talk about the well-being of communities and how it's tied to that. Right. Um, so, so my story, how I sort of got into food justice, it was a lot to do with health, right? So understanding that in black people, seeing people in my family, right, um, as they got older, getting sicker, and, and then also thinking about sort of juxtaposing that against, you know, what has been the history of illness in our, in our communities, right? And how come all of a sudden, you know, all these, all these things are popping up? There. So you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of conversation about the diet of African Americans being this thing that, you know, the thing that's killing us. And, and then the reality of the food system and how our food is being prepared and being grown and being raised right now, and understanding that that is a major factor around it because like my grandmother is still actually alive and 103, right? Oh, wow. So <laughs> she, you know, and she eats the same things that, you know, the same cultural foods that have been eaten in black families for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so under, so when I really sort of understood that it, was, it wasn't the food necessarily that we were eating, you know, how we were eating the food, but actually the food that, how it was, we were getting this food, right? And the industry that's preparing this food and that's raising this food. Um, and so I, I sort of see food access as like, and health as like this gateway drug into food justice, right? And land justice <laughs> and understanding, because once you start unpacking that, you know, it's not just about food, and then people's livelihoods, and it's also about, you know, you also think about what, what Noel had talked about, you know, the, um, the how we are perpetuating poverty within our communities, right? So one of the words that I hear a lot of times in food justice and the food movement is, um, is food deserts, right? So everyone's like, oh, we have these food deserts. And as a food justice worker, that we, we don't use the term food justice. We, we don't use the term food um, deserts anymore. We use the term food. Um, apartheid, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding that mm -hmm. this is our naturally occurring phenomena, a natural occurring environment that happens in our in our in our atmosphere mm -hmm. and our geography. So we are want to make sure that people are understanding that this is something that's being done to communities of color through perpetuating um, white supremacy and capitalist practices that, that perpetuate po poverty, right, in our community. So we're not talking about the real issues of the root issues of why these things, you know, why these things are happening within our communities. Then we're not really atta attacking the issue, um, you know, the way I, the way that I see it. And I don't, you know, this is my personal politic around, you know, what I think is important um, to sort of get to the root issues of what and why we have these issues within our communities, right? So, um, so that's sort of how, you know, I came into food justice. Uh, you know, on the on the health on the health tip, and then as I dissected it more, I understood there was so much more to it than just the health of, of folks. You know, and, and how and we can't get past that. We won't be able to, to fix the health situation until we deal with all these other issues as well. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So just to piggyback on that, and I'm going to talk about myself, my work as well. So at the food trust, I really do try to dive deep into 
equity and health equity, and I really try to look at the, all of the social determinants of health and see how it all intersects with each other and either makes us healthier or more unhealthy. And you know, when we look at issues in communities and the whole notion of justice, right, and how justice takes lots of different forms around fair wages, that you pay people, around how a community is treated by law enforcement, um, how access to quality education leads to other opportunities, uh, and if, whether or not they actually can get a place to get an apple or you know some produce, and it all makes a difference. And you know we see lots of attention right now, and I am a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement. And you know when we look at unrest happening in Baltimore and folks are looking at unrest and you know thinking about like all the issues that communities have that soup that community that we witnessed where there was lots of unrest haven't had a supermarket since the riots in which you know happened after the death of king so you know again none of this is by accident it's by design it's intentional oppression of communities so i definitely kind of agree where you're coming from with that so i think the beautiful thing though about you know the beautiful thing about suppressing something. And, and what I see in communities of color is the ability to, to resist, right? And to be resilient in these, in, in these wonderful ways. So like right now in Baltimore, there is, um, they started after the after the riots, the black churches in Baltimore, we actually, Philadelphia was a huge part of, of sending food down to Baltimore during that time. And, um, and so we distributed, I also organized with a group called Black Bill Farm Collective out of the DMV area. And we organized getting food and um, produce down there to folks in the, in the area. And so the black um, preachers out there were like, you know what, we can do this. And so right now they have a Baltimore Black Food Church Alliance or something where they have like 25 churches who have come together, black churches who have come together and decide they're going to utilize their land to provide food for the neighborhood. So, you know, so something like that sparks, you know, these, these really beautiful, you know, ways of, of us being together. So now folks who have never been in community together that way are now in community around something a lot larger. And that will help them um, to have to, to build their community a lot better than it is than it is right now, right? So so I think about that with Philadelphia as well. And sort of thinking about all of our, our farms that we have, the urban farms that we have in the city, one of which is urban um, urban creators, which I work at at with Stanley and also Urban Tree Connection now being black and brown led organizations in the city that are that are about that are fed by the people in the community, right? And so that those things, the ideas that come up with the farms, the, the, the practices, the workshops that we have, everything that we're doing is really bred from the folks who live there and saying that this is, you know, this is what we want, this is what we need, and it's all beautiful. And so that's a beautiful that like I love that part of my work, mm -hmm. that we have this, you know, that out of that, you know, out of this um, this oppression, like this deep the desire for you know for to, to hold us down, that without without a doubt we always come out of that and excel in these beautiful ways. Yeah, yeah and I, I think the thing that I would just add around that is there's also just, um, most of us probably feel disconnected from the meal on our table. So even the meal that we get this evening, you know, if we were to think about the chicken, where did the chicken come from? Who raised that chicken? What was the chicken fed? How much, was, how much did the person get paid that tended to that chicken? or the people who are preparing it now, how much of it, you know, there's all these questions that we don't necessarily consider or know um, as we consume our meals. And, you know, the average time that we spend um, preparing our own meals, even compared to growing our, our own meals, even within the generations of my own family are vastly, you know, separate um, or different um, and, and reduced, obviously, in time. And I think that the, there's this, um, you know, as, as we're experiencing the crisis of capitalism, where we're literally working many hours just to go home and prepare to come back to work again, you know, people are looking for this sense of convenience around food, and then there's the part that gets lost around the cultural connection, the connection to, to the food, or even just the skill of growing food. And so I think that that's an important part of what we try to bring within our work, is reconnecting people um, back to that um, that skill that has been lost in a lot of ways, and that we're all connected to. Um, we all have some connection to growing food. My my own family had. I grew up with Victory Gardens, um, and that wasn't. And now it's like, you know, some of the kids that we work with, 
um, that are new to our programs, you know, they couldn't necessarily identify that the potato chip came from the potato plant or that the ketchup came from the tomato. And then we had some kids who've been in our program for years that are, know everything about farming. Like, it, it's pretty incredible. And I think that's the beautiful thing about learning how to grow food is that there's, if you, you maybe think of this when you're talking about resilience, is that there's so many lessons to learn from nature when you see what it takes for a seed to germinate, when you see what it takes to thrive and grow and to mature. Um, th there's so many, um, and, and that's the reconnection back to nature and environment and land that we need um, in order to help us even think about our relationship to food in general. You know, like there's so many uh, even mental health issues that are connected to consumption of food um, and sort of like some of us use it to cope, and some of us, you know, abuse food. And you know, how are how are we th rethinking our relationships to food in terms of how we gather with community, how we heal ourselves, how it's medicine for our bodies, um, and who are the people who are actually feeding us and, and feeding our children and families? Yeah, who in this room grows grows food? Who's a grower? All right, I thought it was a lot of growers. And you know, the healing aspect cannot be, I think, cannot be stressed enough, right? So, and I'm so glad we're sort of, sort of moving in that way, right? Because, um, because the reality of when you work the lands is that you begin to heal, right? And and so in so many ways, right? And and I think that you know that was something that I learned through my my love of nature naturally, and then, and then you know as I stayed in that journey, but sort of raised my child to sort of you know really want to you know spending a lot of time in nature, camping and hiking and those type of things. Um, we under, we learned so many life lessons through that connection with nature. And so um, one of the things that Bell Hooks talks about, she's one of my favorite authors, is um, about you know how black folks disconnecting from the land and being an agrarian folk, right? So we're agrarian people by, by heritage and then, then our disconnect from the land as we migrated north, right? And not being able to have that connection and how that added to, you know, um, how that added to our situation uh, of, you know, feeling, you know, oppressed, right? Not just the oppression, but the feelings of oppression because of that disconnect from the land. And so, that, and so now we have an understanding that, that just putting your hands in the soil have scientifically been proved now, but you know, you can feel it on your own. But now science is telling you that, you know, that absolutely that, that contributes to this healing, right? And so now in Philadelphia, you can get a prescription, right? To they give you prescriptions now for you to go pick vegetables, to pick vegetables and things like that for like some kind of therapy. And so people understand, people are understanding that we have been, as a people, so disconnected from the land. And that, and that the more connected we get to the land, the, um, the more we'll be able to heal. And, then, and that, I think about that as not just you know, our regular healing in our bodies, but also the healing um, that needs to happen between, our, between the races of the folks who live in existence on this, on this um, Turtle Island, right? So, um, so one of the things that, that I, I sort of wanted to, uh, okay, yeah, I'll ask my thought. That's <laughs> a turtle island. I got a whole image in my head and then everything else flew out. <laughs> so I want to touch really quick. So you mentioned, so what a blessing to have a grandmother to be 103 years old, and you said she has been eating the same foods that she's always eaten, right? So the notion of like food and culture and how we as black folks have like, you know, embraced making something out of nothing. So the slave diet based on like the throwaways and where slave masters received all of the better cuts and the more nutritious food, but we made it work and we survived off of it and we have made it delicious and have embraced it as a part of our culture. But there is this thing about like, you know, too much of a good thing. So when you're working with folks, um, around urban ag and local ag and healthy food. How do you avoid being elitist and being disconnected to communities? Um, I think, you know, even my, in my own family, you know, we get jokes, you know, there's jokes about us eating like that white people's food, right? And, and, and you know, how do you avoid um, trampling on someone's cultural traditions and values and history when you're trying to convey a different way yeah. It's so funny because I'm, I'm at this conference this week um, and I was speaking to someone, we had quinoa and she was like, 
I always thought this was like canola, and now I know it's quinoa. She's like, phonics tells me this is canola. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's a, a true question. Um, I think, and, and I can answer that and say that, you know, part of what we do is, is growing off of, like, so Haddington is a 95% black neighborhood, so it's important to us to be growing food um, that people in the community want to eat. Um, that's, that's important. Um, the other thing is also introducing new foods that offer, um, that offer a variety um, and that people can experiment with. Um, and I would say too, never to underestimate what people can do with food, especially working class communities. Because, I mean, I've seen people work wonders with kale and all sorts of things. Um, and that, uh, in a lot of ways, and, and even our kids are not really afraid to try stuff. You know, they'll try purple string beans, they'll try the you know yellow carrots, and we want to introduce them to the to the heirloom you know varieties. Um, but I also think that there's this rich tradition of healers that are within the community and neighborhood and people who have stories of like, oh yeah, I do kind of remember that my grandma would make me go chew on this thing and have a stomach ache and you know, it would, and they're like, oh, this is the name of it and this is, oh, and this is growing right here? Oh, okay, because we call it a, a you know, a wild forage edible or whatever and we come up with people. But people are like, they know it, you know? So it's not too far from us. Um, it's just a matter of like returning back to it. Um, and then there's other stuff where people are like, I don't know about that, I'm not gonna try it. And you know, that's what it is. Um, but I, I think that we have found the mix. And then there's also the reality of growing on an urban farm and there's limited space that you have. And um, you know, you, yeah, so there's that. But I think there's this other important part that we've been experimenting with this year, which is around, um, and I think this is, I don't want to go too deep into it because I think you have a question about it, but it's around safekeeping. And for us, it's really telling the, the stories um, of, so we're doing five crops from the African diaspora and thinking about, you know, the, the story of the seed, how it came to be, how the food is used in different parts of, of the diaspora. Um, but I think that when it becomes something that people can feel connected to um, and that they can see themselves in, then it sort of shifts, you know, the image of what that is. And when you say, like, this is, this is our shit, you know, this is ours, like, this belongs to us, um, it's a different narrative. Yeah. Um, and, sure. yeah, and so it, it, it takes away that, that sort of bougie quality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, so my dad has partisans. And um, before he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he had um, he had colon cancer, prostate cancer, uh, which he's in you know, so he and so 25 years ago when I decided I was going to become a vegetarian, I had lots of wax in <laughs> the house. And I was like, okay, I'm girl. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and 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 so you know, I had this this feeling of sort of like you know being distanced from my just like you know 15 Thanksgivings when I went home and I was like, seriously, there's still nothing I can eat here. And, um, and, and now, my entire family eats, eats very much like I do, yeah. right? So, and, and I see that, and I tell that story a lot, to, you know, so that people can understand that the reality of the health issue in our community is so strong and so present, and, and that we know that we're, that we're, that we're sick. And so people are, know that there, have, there has to be a change. And a lot of times, I don't, you know, I don't preach changing, um, changing what you eat, but maybe how you prepare what you eat, right? So I know collard greens have just as much nutritional value as kale does, right? You know, but kale is sexy right now, so people want to eat that. Quinoa, I don't eat at all because quinoa is displacing people in the, uh, their staple crop in, in South America, right? So quinoa is something that we want to have here in America, and so because we want to have it, and it's only grown in one place in the whole world right now, and so they're trying to grow it here in America, but it has not been grown on a, on, a, on a mass scale, right? But the more of us who want quinoa, the more of them, the more of those folks in South America have to produce this crop, and then they don't have access to it, and they can't afford to eat that traditional crop, right? So what we yeah. eat is really and thinking about what, what the food is, what we you know, where the food comes from and who is being displaced and how we, you know, as Americans 
um, and as the dominant, you know, sort of the dominant society is able to go into other countries and say, hey, this is what we want, so we can go to Whole Foods and have 22 different rices, you know, and not understanding that you are taking something very precious away from people, and that goes into the story of seeds and how we pass on our culture through seeds, right? And how seed keeping is, you know, not seed saving, but seed keeping is the, is the practice of, is the sort of the story of the seed as well as the, the saving of the seed. And, and part of, you know, our sort of move into this new industrial food system had um, has diminished our ability to um, to grow the seeds and the foods that we've been growing traditionally across the world, right? So like, you know, there are hugely, like thousands of varieties of seeds a day Foods that we were able a day are, are being displaced, right? We're being, you know, I wish I had a better word for that. But so they're going out, and you, we don't have that. They have them in that. Actually, they have them in food bank. They have seed banks like all over the world. Little seed banks that keep some potentially having somebody can swim out to this big giant place in the Antarctic and maybe get our seeds back. So, um, so, so scientists have them, the governments have them in different places, but we can't have them and utilize them. But those stories, so it seems kind of a story, right? So a story is like. You know, we have a seed here that we grow um, that's a fish pepper. And it's a beautiful um, green and white striped pepper. It's a little tiny pepper. And if you let it go to, you know, if you let, most of the peppers that we eat are green, that are green are not fully ripe, right? So most peppers when they're fully ripe are red. So in this non-fully ripe stage, this beautiful pepper, fish pepper, is, is white and green. And that story, the fish pepper, um, was actually brought over here from Haitians who used to work the railroads in the 1800s. So the 1800s, most of the people who were cooking on the railroads were of Haitian descent. And so they made this fish stew. And then the fish stew was really hot. And people would say, how do you get that taste? Because I don't, they didn't see any pepper in there. And that was through that pepper seed, that, that fish pepper. And so after the Haitians were, you know, after the sort of time moved on, and they weren't working the railroads anymore, that, that fish pepper fell out, of, fell out of use. So people couldn't find it anywhere. Where's the seed pepper? And right here outside of Philadelphia, there is a man in the media, um, and, he, and his name is Weaver, Wade Weaver. William Wade Weaver. Weaver. William Wade Weaver, grandfather, not him. His grandfather <laughs> oh, was a seed wow. saver. Was a seed saver, and he would, um, and he would help because he was a healer as well. He had an appointment that he made that would, he would give that to Horace Pippen. Do people know who Horace Pippen is? So he's a famous, you know, Philadelphian slash Haitian, Haitian Philadelphian here artist. And he would go over to Boys Weaver Farm and in exchange peppers, those, those fish peppers, for the ointment that he needed for his bunion on his foot, right? And so when William Boys Weaver was able to take over, he found this menagerie of seeds in his grandfather's basement when they passed away and was able to reproduce those seeds. Now we can grow those seeds in our garden and tell our young people that these seeds came from your you know, ancestors in Haiti on, on the way through the railroad. So those stories have so much meaning, right? And so when I do talk to a lot of times, I'll ask gardeners or growers, like, do you have stories? And they'll give these amazing stories. And so reintroducing the idea of the story to keep our culture, right, the continuity of culture through the stories that the seeds carry is a really important part of what the work is that we do as well. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, you're, so the, the point about like kind of meeting people where they are, um, and I think for the food trust, we operate you know two dozen farmers markets all over the city. And like one of the things that happened early on when we were starting this work, you know, 25 years ago, is that you know we tapped our local growers and lots of them were like Amish folks from Lancaster County, and they would come into mostly black and brown neighborhoods and you know have their crops and. You know, I think we discovered quickly in Norris Square that like folks were not interested in the heirloom tomatoes right. that were being promoted. They wanted more things that were more familiar to them culturally, right? And we were not able to meet that and understanding that. Um, another thing is around like having kale and turnip greens and others and folks were looking for collard greens. So, you know, you're talking to the Amish farmers about the, the, the demand in this community for this particular item, it's like, well, we don't, I don't even know what that is, right? Like, I don't grow that. So, like, making a connection between some southern black farmers and some of the rural Amish farmers about, you know, seed exchange and this, this is, <laughs> this is collard green seeds and this is how you grow it and, you know, and, and now it's pretty much like a staple at our market. So, that, that exchange is, is really important. Um, and, you know, the notion around like diet. So I've been married for like 18 years now, like met my wife on the bus. Um, like, you know, she was like, 
reading like a Toni Morrison book, and she had like these long dreadlocks and like a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I was like, you know, in grad school, and I had my long dreadlocks and like my hip hop book bag, and I was going to go work at a coffee shop on Main Street. And we, you know, made eye contact, and I sat next to her, and I kind of made fun of like the paradox, like the, lo the locks and the chicken and all that stuff, right? Like, oh no, no, this is not mine. I'm vegetarian. This is for my family, and then I'm, I'm home, and etc. So we hit it off, right? And you know, we we're like dating heavily, and she is not only like vegetarian, but she's vegan, and not even that, like, but she doesn't have any animal products at all, like rubber shoes and hip belts and everything, right? So we go to her family's house for Thanksgiving, and she goes into the kitchen. And she comes out with a big bowl of chitlins. And she sits down and puts hot sauce on it. And she starts eating the chitlins. I'm freaking out, right? It's going on. And she's like, this is family. This is what we do with family. So it gave me an early lesson. Um, so, you know, I did Peace Corps and I did it with my wife. And, you know, we have the same diet. And I, I, you know, I, I don't eat a lot of meat, um, never really have, but you know, she was still like vegetarian. But then when you go and sit down with someone who, with love and care and then limited resources, prepared a plate of food for you that has meat on it, you sit down and you're thankful and you eat it and you show respect. Um, so having conversations with some of my students about like diets, like well, you know, we normally don't eat this, right? Like goat is not something I normally eat. And, and, and they're like, well, you know, what do you do? Like, well, mostly plant-based, et cetera. And like, how about you? Like, yeah, us too, because we can't afford it, right? So like, they didn't have a lot of meat in their diet, which kind of leads me to this next seg seg segment, right? So the changing diet and the changing demand, the growing demand for like meat across the world is having like devastating impacts, right? So, so much of our, Farmland is devoted to grazing. So much of our crops that are planted go to feed animals. It's having, um, as the developing nations begin to have more affluence, the, the rising middle class wants to have this in their diet as well. Uh, you know, we have the Amazon being deforested so that cattle can graze, etc. right? So it's problematic in lots of different ways. And in 1931, like Winston Churchill predicted that there was going to be synthetic lab-grown meat, right? And we're there, we're there today, like it's, it's happening. And I think the notion of like growing a chicken leg in a wing instead of the whole chicken, like makes a lot of sense. Like it will avoid having this demand on like agriculture, it's gonna be better for emissions and climate change. It has all these other benefits, right? And some people view GMOs as you know something that's good, drought resistant uh, you know, seeds and you know, we know that their patents tied to it, etc. But a lot of people argue that this is human progress and that this is the future of food. I'm just really curious to know, as you know, local food champion, what are your thoughts on all of this? <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> well, I, I think that that's operating under this assumption that we can continue at the pace that we are and that there's just an unlimited amount of resources that are untapped and so this idea of like oh we'll just create a new technology that will address this is going to be the solution um and actually it's like well we we're we're past that point i mean so we're going to have to we're going to have to really think about what are we willing to give up in order to really sustain the future of our survival in the future um, and what it will take in order to restore even this planet um, to good health. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, GMOs have, opens up a whole nother conversation of who gets to own what. Um, and it's the privatization of seeds, of food that continues to displace small farmers. Um, 
and continues the crisis. So um, I, I don't think that that is the visionary um, path that we need in order to think about, um, like that feels like a false solution um, and something that will have devastating effects on other countries outside of the US. Um, yeah, so sometimes I think I live in this, you know, I, I think it's movement work, and like we live in this bubble, right? So there are, you know, there are, there's a, it's a, it's a minority of amount of us, you know, few of us who are doing movement work. Um, so I have to check myself always against my friends and my family to make sure that I'm just not lost. I lived in Ithaca, New York, for about four years, and and I would come home, <laughs> and then everybody would be like, oh. I would just have, you know, just like, and we in, in Ithaca, you know, it's just like ongoing laughter and joke around, like you know, you're we're three square miles surrounded by reality, and, um, and so, you know, and so we live, some so I so so I constantly challenge myself to remember that I do have this, you know, this um, very different lens of which I look through, through the world at, and so um, so I don't push, I don't. I think that everyone shouldn't eat meat. Yes, I think people should eat meat responsibly. I don't police anyone for in their diet. Um, I think that people will come to the understanding of what is happening on their in their own way in their own time. Um, I, I know that you know our desire for meat is definitely devastating our planet. I'm an environmentalist first, right? So I don't I don't think about ways that we can scale up and do more you know, vertical farming um, because I think it's really important for us to build soil. I don't think about you know, how we can reproduce you know, fish in a barrel because I think it's really important that our fisheries and our fishermen who have been doing this for a long time can make a livelihood in the, in the, on the seas. And, you know, so there, and those are cultural things that are also that really have meaning as well that, we, um, that I've, I'm, I'm willing to say we're, we're done with that. We need to focus on how we can just all survive right? in this way. In this, um, and I guess that, for me, feels very um, limited. And I have, I understand the earth to be very abundant, right? And that, you know, if we do things in the right way, then we can all definitely coexist here in a very beautiful way, right? And it's just about, you know, who, um, who's holding those resources and allowing, and, 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 how, and how they're sharing that or utilizing resources. And so um, I, I, I know that just recently, I've been doing a whole bunch of traveling the last few months. And when I'm in California, and I'm, and I'm in a room of folks, and the, they are movement work folks, so I just will not keep that. that and when we talk, when we do visionary, when we do vision sessions in the future, everyone's like, and there's land, and there's water, and there's food, and there. So no one ever said, and there's buildings, and there's tree, and you know, and there's concrete, and there's cars. Like that never comes up. So and so then I, you know, and I, in Colombia, I'm having conversations with people down there, and it's the same thing. So so then I realized that actually maybe my perspective isn't so small, right? Maybe it's just small in this in this in this American context, right? But in a world context, people don't think of the um, their future in boxes. Of, of, of buildings and, and, and places that people are confined to, that people enjoy the earth and they enjoy, you know, experiencing these things that are beautiful around them and, and understand that the earth is, is important to us because we are earth beings, right? So, um, so I don't see, you know, and I thought about the two, the two like the, you know, the two food systems that were really that you have mentioned earlier. That's my first time hearing that. And, and I don't think that there are enough of us who are really thinking in that way for to really go there. And, and I think there are enough of us who are thinking about how important it is to grow food in the land, how important it is for us to, 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 um, to connect with the animals and the, and the trees and the water. When I, when I think about the huge mass amount of people who had did the exodus to, you know, to go down to, to, um, to fight against the, um, the, in the, in the, in the Dapple um, movement, you know, that was powerful and just the sheer amount of folks who would said that water is really important, right? And once we understand the way that we're eating meat, like the, those, the feces from the animals that we create, like outside of like what they're doing to the land, is, is creating havoc on our water system, right? So once you, once we understand, and, and so for me it's more about education, right? So how, how can we get those stories out to people? How do you, how do people know, start understanding that people who have been doing fisher communities that have been living on, on water for, for generations are now not able to take home the fish that they grow and that someone else owns that because they bought those stock in the commodity on, on, on the internet. That our fishes, our, our, our oceans are being sold off on the internet. When people start understanding the reality 
of the food system that they're trying to tell you is what's best for you, then they're going to deny that and say, that, and, you know, because that is my belief in the people and understanding what we need and what we want and what we desire and not the government or the systems that say this is what you want. So I have faith in people understanding what's important to them and eventually we'll get that, we'll get that understanding on a larger level. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I struggle with it. Like, you know, again, like for me, like eating less meat is a conscious decision because I do want to be better for the earth and for my own body. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm lucky that my, you know, daughters who are teenagers have kind of moved in that direction as well. And they actually moved me in that direction. So even though I, like, we were at Noel's event the other day, and my daughter, who is 15, came over and said, hey, taste this. Does it have meat in it? <laughs> like, I need, I'm the test, the tester for, like, product and stuff. Do you sometimes? Um, I do sometimes, yes. Yeah, so, you know, it's not a clean break. Um, but you know, I'm conscious about it and, and, and moving in directions that work for me when they do and when they don't, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, like, it's like the quinoa, I'm like, what? Is that one of us now too? You know? And, yeah, because once you know, you have that knowledge, then, you know, you are supposed to be responsible. And that's the education piece I'm talking about, right? So once people know, they can move and change in, in these ways. And so it is really about us getting those things out there, right? So that people can think about it. Yeah. And have a choice. Yep. Um, we talked about like a little bit about seed preservation and particularly around how the great youth that you're working in. So if you haven't had a chance to visit either farm, then you really have to because it's incredible and, and especially go when the youth are there. Um, but again, I was there on Sunday and you know your youth were kind of running this like seed preservation clinic for folks and um, you know I was just excited to see that and I know both of you work with youth. And you know, how can we have a talk about the future of food, and if we don't, you know, talk about youth and their place in it? So, you know, what's up? Yeah. So um, we have a youth apprenticeship program where we uh, do one-on-one -on -one mentoring with young people who are high school age um, around urban farming, operating farm stands, and. Um, we're doing popular education, so community-wide education. Um, and for, I think we're, we're starting to think about our young people more and more, um, about how, so we're trying to make a shift to really think about what does community stewardship of land look like, and we see our young people at the forefront of organizing their peers and organizing their families and their neighbors um, around how can we reclaim these spaces for public use, use for the neighborhood, for, for the commons. And so, um, yeah, we see our young people as the people who are able to reach, um, reach the community in, in the most significant way because they just have a pulse on what's happening. Um, and you know, we even we even have some of our young people. We have one young person who goes to Saw, that um, the agriculture school, which is really exciting for us. So you know, a lot of times it's, it's challenging because you know we're a nonprofit and uh, we a lot of our money that comes in is through uh, through foundations and, and grants and. A lot of times the lingo around young people programs is like, you should have a STEM education program or you should um, be training young people for the workforce. And we absolutely want to see black and brown farmers you know, in the, in the agriculture system. And we want that option to be there for them. We want them to be skilled in those ways. But I would say what's most primary for us is them as people. Like the people that we're helping develop them to become into this world. Like that to me is our primary responsibility to the young people we work with is that they're embedded with a sense of um, how do I have, how do I, how am I able to analyze the conditions of my neighborhood and know it's not inherently my fault or my family's fault that we live in, the, in this type of conditions, um, but to have a structural analysis of that and how can we be the ones to shift that. Um, and so we want them to inherit a legacy of, you know, we, we can change things, you know, we, we can be a part of developing our community in a different way. And so that, that feels like my primary, our primary responsibility and how we're connecting our work to um, how uh, really the young people are at the forefront of that. I, I, I'm blessed to have, and to be in the role of community organizer, 
um, with the Law Center allows me to interact with all the different farms in the city. Right? And um, so, you know, all, although I'm a farm manager at Urban Creators, I tell them all the time, I just grow food. So I don't do, I don't, I'm not hugely involved in the youth programming, but so in my, my, in my role as a community organizer, I'm able to like, you know, interact with young people at all these different farms all the time. And, um, and, and to see their growth, and also to see the programming, and how the programming at these farms are affecting their young people, and I just must, and I just, it's incredible, right? So the, 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 um, the self-esteem that our young folks come out with, um, out of the food, and I must say the food justice movement in general, like the folks that I know in New York, the folks that, like, you know, I, there are here yeah, in Boston, they come out of the food project, the folks, you know, 20 years ago who are now like, you know, movers and shakers in this food movement, you know, entrepreneurs in, in their own way, and understanding that, you know, that we're not just, we're not just cultivating food, we're cultivating people, right? And our farm, I call it, I think we created, it's called Life to Grow, because the, the young people who started the farm were very clear that, you know, we're not just growing food, we're growing communities, we're growing people. And so, um, so that's a central theme that I hear a lot of times around the folks who are, you know, folks who are, who are gross grassroots movement folks who are doing this work, right? Understanding that we're not just trying to instill, you know, um, basic, you know, skills, like basic growing skills in our young people. We're, we're imparting in them so much more. When I was in Ithaca, we started a, um, the Youth Farm Project up there, the Ithaca Youth Farm Project, and the folks who um, came out of that our first two years are like, went to, ended up going to school, changed their whole major, and ended up going to school for things very related to environment and, and food. And so just watching and seeing how pivotal these programs are to our young people, to giving them hope that they can do something different and be something and be change, it, change agents in their communities is really, you know, it's really important and, and it's a beautiful thing to see. Now through my work at Black Dirt Farm Collective, we've been able to, we have this connection with the farms here in Philadelphia, so we've been able to bring the farm, the young people that are part of our programs out to Maryland on, in, our, in our rural farm down in Maryland on the Eastern Shore. And like this summer we did our first like all team retreat and it was amazing. There's like 25 children from the, from the not children, but <laughs> teenagers from the city who came out on the land, most of them who have never been in, in that kind of situation ever, who brought their tents, who set them up in the, by themselves out in the, in the streams all week, like you know, just really being free. And I feel like, you know, when I saw them and I, and I saw how, how close they got with their comrade, people, young people that they didn't know before, you know, not having to be hard like they do, right, in these urban spaces, and just having the ability to, like, you know, express themselves in this way that was clean and not judged and not mocked and, and not policed, right? Like, we have so much, and they were, the three days and they came out of that just changed, right? And I, and they, I get emails from the folks who work with and say, you know, our young people are really on fire. And then they come back and they say, hey, you know what, we want to continue to get together, right? So now we're starting a, a youth um, policy, pro, um, urban ag policy group, right? Because they want to make change and they want their voices to be heard in their community. So these, you know, these them being able to have these excursions that really build leadership within them, and that, that we're, we are we are really changing the face of what our, you know, the um, the future of our children and our young people and what they have to look forward to. And I'm grateful to be a part of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so the food trust is also a youth element to our work. Um, so we have an initiative called Get Hype Philly. Um, so Hype started as a school-based program. And it really was uh, youth becoming wellness champions for their school. So it was them deciding that they weren't going to do bake sales anymore, but do smoothie sales, mm -hmm. and that they would be leading movement breaks in the, in the in the school environment. And from that, we grew it um, to an out of school time initiative. And Greener Partners is um, one of one of the partners of this initiative, as well as um, a, a dozen other organizations. And Last year, we uh, had our, our, our high school summit where we brought together these school leaders from all over the city and, you know, were in these breakout sessions. We wanted to know about the issues that are important to them and what's happening in their lives and lots of things rise to the top, but the number one thing was around the quality of water in the schools. And the kids, you know, gave these anecdotal stories about how the water was brown, how it was tepid, they had a bad odor, how some didn't have water at all, so they had to pay to get water, that uh, the old porcelain water fountains had no pressure, you had to put your mouth on the nozzle. And it's just really clear that we're struggling with all these health issues, and these kids don't have a basic 
human right like water. Right. So we work with them and partner with other organizations like Youth United for Change, shout out to Noel's husband, Raphael, who's the executive director. Um, and they led this youth-led advocacy campaign um, where they testified at the uh, School Reform Commission, where they met with Councilwoman Kim and had other council testimony opportunities and went knocking on doors in City Hall and really told their stories and talked about what they wanted to see. And then we get like a midnight tweet by like Dr. Hype, who was like, I told y'all I'm gonna put one million dollars to get three hydration stations in every school, which he never said. But <laughs> really happy that they, they did this. And for the students, they still advocated for like the safety of water, and there's like an accompanying like legislation around lead testing in, in schools. And that was all student-led. So this year, we are starting our school year, and we're asking about issues and things that are important to them. School meals and school food is rising to the top, so we'll see. And the funny thing is, like, they think policy change is, like, easy. Like, oh, all you do is go in, and you tell people what you want, and they give it to you. <laughs> Sounds right. Sounds right. So, you know, again, I think there are some incredible young people who are leading the way, and, you know, we just need to get out of their way, yeah. give them some more they need, and, and follow. Yeah. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll break into a Q&A. And this is, you mentioned about kind of reclaiming space for public use. And, you know, this city doesn't have any shortage of vacant lands, vacant buildings, vacant properties. Um, you know, talking about vertical farming and the utilization of like distressed properties for that. Looking at this new land bank and looking at Angel Rodriguez from APM, who is now the executive director of the land bank of Philadelphia, with these 40,000 vacant lots across the city. Is this an opportunity to grow agriculture in our city? And if so, kind of what would it take to make it a reality for folks? Well, soil generation has been part of, um, was part of creating the language around the land bank, um, the land bank law. And so we were coalesced at the time as Healthy Free Street Spaces. We've changed our name since, name since then, and also the, the, the character of our, of our organization, of our coalition. At the, at the time, it was really important to get strong language in there around urban agriculture that would allow us to utilize the land bank in a way that would be meaningful for folks to grow food. Mm -hmm. um, so. As all city things, and it's been a long journey, and sometimes you know two steps forward, or is that three steps forward, two steps back? Um, so, and then we had so we had the administration change last year, and with that change, you know, came um, a, a, a re understanding that we had to re-educate the folks who are now making decisions at a certain level. And so, um, so I, I would say that we in, initially had a really strong sense that the land bank was, you know, it was the language that was being touted was like, you know, this was going to be this the, this bridge between the community and the city because there's been a long history of really bad land management in Philadelphia, and so folks don't trust the city with regard to that for, for various nefarious reasons back in the day, and so um, so we thought that this was going to be, yeah, a great, you know, a great thing that's going to happen for the folks who are who are gardening, you know, the majority of folks who are growing food in the city, and I just want to stress that uh, urban agriculture has been happening in the city for decades, right? People have been growing food on land in Philadelphia for a very long time. Um, you know, anywhere, you know, and you, most of these folks, most of our folks who are, you know, who are growing food are come from agrarian backgrounds, and so, you know, when you see something that's open and it's vacant, and, you know, you're like, the land is there and I have this skill, then the natural thing is to, to plan something on that, right? And so, um, so the new sort of movement of urban agriculture, and we don't want to erase the fact that there has been decades and a very history, long history of Philadelphia of growing food in this city. So we have lots of gardens that have been here 70 years, 50 years, 30 years, and those, a lot of those gardens are um, illegal, right? So they are not on land that they own. Um, they don't always have permission to be on that land, but they've existed for quite a long time and have been very pivotal in their communities. And so we saw the land bank as a way to um, to help shift that, you know, to help shift the power of the land ownership into back into community hands. Um, and that hasn't happened yet. So we are still rating, you know, and still educating and still hoping with Angel, you know, he just came in. And he can't, I can't say that he came into, you know, a really challenging situation because, you know, um, our, our, polit our politicians here, our city council people like to hold on to land. And so the land bank was supposed to be a pass-through. Um, and so, um, so, 
So at first we had issues because folks didn't know who put the land in there. <laughs> so it's like, no, this land bank with the land in it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then the council people were like, well, you guys don't know how you're going to distribute the land, so we're not going to put any land in there until you figure that out. And that just happened, actually just happened this past December, right? So December, um, the, the, the disposition policies went in. January, they voted on it and said, okay, we're going to move forward. And so now um, we're able to sort of start passing land to the land bank. And um, so now it's like, so do we have money for the thing, you know? And so we, I feel like, so we got, uh, we felt as the urban agriculture community, we felt a little snowed when we came with the, when the disposition policies came out because with the land bank had, um, when, they, when we did the larger strategic plan three years ago, um, they had allocated a certain amount of money for a certain amount of spaces for urban ag, certain amount for um, low income housing and that type of thing. And so what happened in the disposition policies this year is that they said they would give, um, they would prioritize six lots for vacant land a year. So, Out of 40,000. For, 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 for gardening, right? So, and so, and so the fact that we already have folks who have been waiting for this forever, who have land already, and if, if you know, you've been to gardens, you've seen community gardens, they're not just one parcel, right? So most of them are three parcels, four parcels, you don't, you know, so you just, that might be just two gardens. Six parcels might be just two gardens that might be saved through the land bank this year, right? We gotta get the youth on that. We gotta get the youth. We'll put your people on that. That's why I'm telling the story, because we need some help with preserving. So in the meantime, what happens to our, to our gardens, because now there's a big push that everyone's looking at, the fact that there's gardens out there and there's vacant land out there. There's a huge development boost that's happening right now. And so um, we're seeing gardens this year, since the January, being pushed into share sale faster than ever, right? So we have, and they have a really ridiculous policy where let them go into share cell and then we'll go the day of and we'll take it off the lot. Hopefully, if we don't miss it, if we know that that's the address, if the council person sent something in ahead of time. So what we've been doing is like scrambling. It's a lot of us, those of us that work in the FPAC and the Urban Act Working Community <laughs> Committee has been, have been working sort of scrambling consistently to, to make sure that people aren't losing their land. And we're not winning, right? So we're not winning and we need people to understand that we need council to protect our advisors um, outside of hopefully, you know, when we come into a network around when we do our work around the city, meet people who live in that area of town, and it's like, I'm looking for land. Like, well, we have this land over here. And sometimes those things happen naturally, which has been a beautiful thing, but there's not a systemic, right, solution to that issue. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think the two questions are sort of related that you were speaking to because succession planning can't happen when someone decides they're leaving. But that actually, um, part of our work has to be about building people's capacities that's a critical part of the work. Um, and so I, I, I can't even name the number of places where I've worked where people have learned to do a job, um, but necessarily they, they aren't necessarily taught or developed in a way that puts them in a position to make decisions or to lead certain things. And so, um, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about in this position is how am I cultivating the next leadership that will come after me um, so that I can because I, I know that I have a time there, and then there's going to be someone that needs to build the organization beyond me. Um, and so how I, so part of my responsibility is to be doing that work as well. So we're at time. Um, do you have anything else final you need to say? You're more than welcome. If not, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I especially like to thank our panelists. Um, excellent job. I really appreciate you being here. Coordinating this is like a challenge. It's like I'm like in a hotel lobby and you're like flying at an airport and you're going to Pendle Hill after this. So it's like getting us all together here is a minor miracle. But I really thank you all for coming out tonight and being a part of this conversation. Um, and we hope that we can keep it going outside of tonight. And there's a long lasting uh, connection that's been made. So thank you so much. And um, I, I'm pretty sure they're bringing out some dessert for anybody who does want to stick around. So feel free to hang for a few and, and mingle with those at your table too. But uh, thanks again for all of you for coming.
conversation around urban agriculture doesn't get put in competition with affordable housing and that we see both as critical um, points of stabilizing communities that you need the most affordable housing and you need green spaces in communities and so we've worked with um, PCAG, the uh, Philadelphia Coalition on Affordable Communities. Um, their development without displacement campaign to make sure that, you know, as we're testifying at the land bank and having and attending their board meetings, that we're saying that we're in solidarity with one another, we support each other um, around these policies that, that we want to see both. Um, because, and, and 
to be seen what happens with the land bank. I, I'm hopeful that they will act on behalf of communities, but but to be seen what what will happen. Um, so we've been talking for a while. We definitely want to open it up, um, open the floor to anyone who may have questions. Or you, or you may just want to enjoy your food. Or for you guys. Yeah. Again, you started off. I didn't hear it at the very beginning. Oh, okay. well, uh, you guys talked about some of the grassroots work that you were doing, and, uh, and you did touch upon policy and how the kids were excited that they felt like they could influence policy. So my question is, considering how much human justice stems from lobbyists, what policy would you hire the most powerful lobbyists to help you? Black land. Well, that's not even a question for me. Black land. So we need land. We need land. Our farmers need land. Our young people need land to farm, to do whatever it is. You know, I think that reparations in this country is overdue for black folks. And so the first, the, the biggest thing for me is land. Yeah. Preservation of black land specifically. And access to more. I work on so many policy issues, it's really hard to like elevate one, but the one that I think has been really effective for multiple reasons is probably our incentive program around SNAP use, um, which is problematic because, you know, a third of our city depends on SNAP, which is broken to begin with. And I would rather have us off of SNAP and able to live out of poverty. But the reality is that the that we need multi-pronged strategies, um, and that I mean, this current administration is telling us that policies can be reversed and shifted with with any administration. And so, policy is one important, but I would say it's not the only tactic that we need around addressing these issues. For us, it's also about building the alternatives. Um, so when we talk about building building a local food system where people are organized together to create the type of community that they want and need, um, that is as a criti critical and important as, as the part around policy as well. Keep them coming. Um, I'm really curious if you, um, uh, so one of the things that I didn't mention in my one of the things I didn't mention in my introduction is that um, I'm on the board of a CFC in West Philadelphia called Community Solutions CDC in the last year or two. And um, food waste is actually a really um, very important thing to us. So we, uh, the, the founder um, has worked out an arrangement with four local um, grocery stores, um, ShopRite, uh, Fresh Grocer, um, I think all the and the indoor Trader Joe's and Panera, and he gets a lot of surplus from all of these places. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And we distribute it for free, no income requirement, no sign in or anything. Every he does it every Saturday and every Tuesday. And I mean, last weekend I think we got about 30 families that come to us. They're there, they line up, you know, they they take it's available. Um, and that's one way to combat it. But there are also big organizations such as my employer Drexel and their um, catering arm, which is now Airmark, um, that just wastes so much food. It just goes right in the trash. It goes from the kitchen to the trash sometimes, literally, which I just find like deplorable, especially because the culinary school has a food waste <laughs> program. <laughs> but they're not related to the to Airmark. They don't they, they can't be in all of the events, you know, et cetera. But so I wonder if there are any policy movements going on about reducing food waste, especially from these big, you know, organizations where they are probably the most guilty of it. I know um, that the Food Policy Council here in Philadelphia 
is working on waste is one of the uh, our project areas. Uh, food waste is one, of, and we also have been pushing the city um, as an institution to um, purchase, like, purchase, um, to the good food purchasing project pro process, is it policy process. Um, also, but procurement. procurement. Thank you. Um, so that they prepare food in a, in a responsible way, but also thinking about their waste. Um, so I'm, I'm a strong believer in people, I guess you can hear that. And I think that people need to make changes and that people can create um, the way that, that, that influences policy, right? Or that says that this is important. So I think about that specifically around the young people and um, the good, um, there's a, what is the name of that? There's a young man who came out of the food, um, the food project in Boston and he started this, um, project for across college campuses. And so now they are doing, what do you know the real food? The Real Food Challenge, right? So the Real Food Challenge, and um, is and so young people in schools are like, okay, enough is enough, how do we change the situation, right? And so they're, they're, they're challenging their institutions to do things differently, right? So it's about how do we challenge the institutions that are around us to make change and, and create change also, right? So, I, and so, so there's a little bit wrong with that, right? In, in the sense that you know, it's not. It shouldn't. It shouldn't have to be, right? Just the people or the, to make the change. However, I know that what I, you know, watching and understanding movements, movements and change happen because of the people. So in honoring that and understanding that, so when we, we when we require from our city council to make changes to the way that they that they you know don't um, process their waste, their food waste. And because also that food waste can be turned into compost that we can totally use in our gardens around the city, right? It's, it's a hugely environmental problem. And it's an institution like they, but they put it on the individuals, like we would get, you know, fined for not recycling. But they have these huge institutions that just like the, like the, the biggest culprits, right? Are the ones who are not being, you know, so I'm not saying that institutionalize it in the sense that where the folks, where individuals will be, um, will be fined and, you know, persecuted for not doing the thing. I'm saying that as individuals, we should challenge our institutions to make changes and so and so there is you know there's a good food purchasing process uh, pur purchasing project <coughs> something GPPP GPPP that's what I know and that's for cities and that's a legislation that was created adopted a model legislation that was adopted that cities can adopt on their own and create and, re and sort of recreate to, um, to sort of move you know food coming in a certain way the city is this there's no I don't know any national um, model policy around around food waste yet, yeah, so they could have When the NFL draft was here, you know, they were using the Food Connect app mm -hmm. to, to get rid of surplus. I didn't hear about that. But it's sort of like, it's sort of like lip service if they just do it for one big event and then they don't bother with anything else. You know, where there's a university that does it all the time, every day, but, you know. Why did they do it? Uh -huh. um, I said, then why did they do it? I can ask something about the food waste. Yeah, good, good. I'm, I'm working with Food Abundance. They just had a report come out that they could be part of the food policy and law. Sorry, I'm Kathy Davis. I'm working with the abundance. Um, they just had a policy come out um, with Harvard Law and Policy Clinic that's talking about doing legislation for Pennsylvania food waste policy. So um, we just started doing this, like in the last month. So look for that. And also, I mean, I do want to mention that Philadelphia has a zero waste policy, but they're trying to get to zero waste in 2035 or something like that. The 2535 plan? Yeah. Okay, nice. Do you have any details on what that policy looks like uh, that Phil Bunnis is working with at all? Like, any highlight? Um, it's, it's, a, it's an advocacy policy. The idea is to network with other groups and drive things up this way. Um, and there's a lot of people who are interested in it. Um, and it's just something that they need to work on. And I wish I could remember this, like, seven highlights working with state government, working with city government, is trying to get. Um, a sort of statewide policy on food waste, trying to reduce. Um, more looking at food rescue, which basically is getting right. food into um, people's, onto people's plates, rather than into composting, and also removing it out of landfill, and how we can encourage to do that. Um, so yeah. that, that's the general idea. I can, I can sort of, if anyone's interested, they give me that email, I can um, send on that. Yeah. So it's so interesting, that, like, so you have this standard of quality that we are expected to have around, like, produce. And, you know, the, the growers are discarding their product because it, it isn't of supermarket quality. So I think we, we're starting to see a change in, you know, the ugly food movement, right? And being able to 
find use for some of these products. Waste than I think somebody would want, you know, just with the box itself. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's like a crook neck squash where the neck was too crooked. I mean, it's in the name. I don't know why you wouldn't eat that, <laughs> you know. But, but it's a profitable business, too. And they, they tell you the farmer that it came from. It's relatively local stuff. I think they also do eggs and bread. Um, and it's pretty affordable. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things around like quality food, and we're talking about like the uh, you know pantries and the food relief system, and it's the issue around like equity. So like giving the food we don't want to pantries so that poor people can get it. It's like there is just you know just inherently unequal and without equity throughout it. So but that's a whole other subject. Yeah. Um, so I work with little people, um, which uh, I really enjoy. Um, one of the things that I would really like to see, um, I have a lot of kids who come to me hungry, and it's not just for learning, it's they're hungry. And just case in point, right now I teach in a second grade classroom and we don't eat lunch till 1245. All right. So they're starving and it's the last lunch, they're starving. So we have a snack. But I have a lot of kids that come and they don't they either bring crap for snack, that's what I call it, you bought crap for snack. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll bring they won't bring anything at all because their mom forgot or they or the honest truth is that their mom never remembers. And so what I would really like to see is some sort of, I mean, we're talking a lot about policies, but I would like to see some sort of citywide effort to provide healthy snacks in schools. Mm -hmm. And currently I'm working at a charter school, but I strongly support public school systems, and I left for my own personal reason, but I just don't, I don't, I honestly, I don't think with all of these coalitions and people here sitting here, that it's almost inexcusable for the children of Philadelphia to go into their schools and not have a healthy snack in addition to a healthy meal every day. So what can we do as a community to start filling those gaps for these kids that are coming to us? And the, for some of them, the only meals that they get that are warm are in that school building. Excuse me, in that school building. So the least we can do is, you know, provide apples, provide oranges, provide carrots. And, you know, a lot of times these snacks, yeah, they end up on the floor, but if you start them young, I've never seen a kindergarten, first, second grader turn away food ever when it's put in front of them. Yeah, that's a great, I think, when I, that's a great statement. I think if in any day of the week, if any of you were walking to one of the public schools and see what they're feeding our children <coughs> for lunch, mm. you'd be appalled. Right? We had gray hot dogs like a couple of years ago. Um, they were giving out through some meal program and I was just like, how can we give these out? Um, so that's a huge issue. I'm thankful that the young people are saying like we need to do a mm -hmm. campaign around our school food. Because it really is about, you know, we have this like one of the really, you know, one of the worst school districts in the country. Um, you know, so having that conversation with them around food when they're like 18, I don't know, how is that 18 million dollars in debt or something like that? You know, it's almost like a, a, a you know, no, we're not having those conversations, right? But then I just hear that there's this Fox Chase farm program and that happened in the Northeast and out in the Northeast they have like, you know, agricultural things happening and there's young kids are doing things. In Philadelphia we started a program called, um, I'm sorry, in Ithaca we started a program called the Fresh Snack Fruit and Vegetable Program and we serve um, fresh snacks two times a day to two of the schools in the city that were um, that were had the most um, low income folks who go there and it, it was and it's been an amazing program it's been going on I guess maybe now 10 years and and we source from local we source from local farmers so I so I'm saying it can be done right organizations can absolutely do that here and I think that they have vetry I know vetry is here and they do something to that degree right but but this is a, such a large system and a system that's with so much red tape you know sort of like you know to, to get the whole system the whole school district to say this is something we're going to do is a monumental task right because they won't even educate our kids first and foremost 
So asking them to feed them is like a you know a huge ask, right? So um, so what are we prepared to do then, right? As farmers, I would totally we would totally give food for that, right? And we grew food at the Youth Farm Project to support that project um, because we knew that it was really important for our young people to have food. I've seen the difference between a young person who's not had food and then her her life change completely overnight when she was able to just have access to food for you know on a daily basis right so it's just huge you know the fact that we think that you know our, we're seeing our kids not being able to concentrate and focus and they're saying oh they're ADHD oh they're and a lot of times it's very diet related right they're not getting any sleep they're not getting any food and and I've seen people's lot like literally seeing young people completely change when they have access to those things so for people to not understand how big food is to our young people and to the situation that's happening in our schools it's a it's a it's a problem right it's so I thank you for bringing that up because I'm hoping that everyone right now is thinking about, okay, what are we doing about our kids, right? And what are our kids doing in school? So Rich, you work at the Enterprise Center? No, we work there. Oh, you volunteer there. I know Rebel Foods uh, operates out of the Enterprise Center. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know, maybe you. I don't know that I'm not involved with it. Um, the only thing I know about it is what I've seen on TV. Yeah. Yeah, I just know that this is a youth-led entrepreneurship program, and it's operating out of the Enterprise Center, and it's getting healthier snacks into the schools. Uh, they have a contract with the school district, and it's kind of awesome. Um, so that's just one thing I just wanted to like lift up. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, there's also the Coalition Against Hunger is doing, it's not snacks, but it's school breakfast. So the school breakfast challenge. Um, and they've been working really hard to elevate this issue and get more schools involved in offering in-classroom breakfast and breakfast on the go. So, you know, breaking down the stigma and like the difficulty that folks have, like early mornings kind of getting something to get them going. Um, yeah. Oh, I was gonna Please. <laughs> no, I just had a quick question. Um, so it was definitely was a. Uh, I'm just picking you back off what you were saying. It's very important with you know the children are put because it starts with what you eat, you know, and that gives you the energy to go about the day and things like that. But you look at these um, major corporations, um, whether it's McDonald's or anything that you would think is not good to eat, but their market push. Yeah. It's simple. It's easy for a kid to you know get a cheeseburger. You know, it's fun. You know, what are some of the ways that like some of the organizations that's trying to push these healthier food choices and make it simple? Like as simple as going to the Chinese store or down the street, or as simple as getting a bag of chips. You know, you mentioned like eating an app or something. As they get older, like it's all on the floor and things like that. You start off early. Like, what are some of those ways to make? those healthy choices, you know, just like simple, it's just like what they're supposed to do, you know. I like Reese should enter. That's okay. I like the interaction. Yeah, come on, we're talking. Stop. You know it. You enter. One thing, um, it was kind of cool, the last line you said, to make the healthy choice the easy choice was a lot of sort of the approach that we try to take. Um, there are a lot of work at the food trust, there's a lot of in-store decision making too, like marketing. So like, I know Dwayne's been really active with the drink up campaign and stuff. So making, um, when you go to the drink cooler in a corner store, instead of grabbing a soda, there'll be some signs to encourage you to pick water. Or a lot of ways at retail to encourage healthy choices. Um, but around marketing, that's a great point, like the disproportionate marketing targeted towards children, especially in low-income communities of color. And um, I know there's like, there was the F&B campaign, the fruit and veggie campaign, to try to use those tactics that corporations use for fruits and vegetables with celebrities and making it cool. Um, but I think it's a great point. It's a really big need, and I think there are a lot of good efforts out there, but yeah. Yeah, really There's cool. also a lot of uh, momentum around legislation around predatory marketing yeah. of unhealthy food as well. Yeah. So, you know, limiting the number of like ad placements around unhealthy products in particular neighborhoods. So, like that's a growing movement, and I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see the city and our current health commissioner, who isn't afraid to kind of tackle things from a punitive position, um, take something like that on. I would just say that we, we take a 
a family-based approach. Um, and so we we think of our work as multi-generational because we know that the kids many times aren't necessarily preparing their food, especially the younger ones, and they have less decision-making power over what they're consuming. So we think about a variety of ways to engage the entire family in the growing of food process, but also just like um, having healthy cooking classes, having a or even just coming to the farm and experience being at the farm or the gardens um, as a way to begin to draw them in. So thinking about the entire family. And I think that with the, with the urban agriculture folk, we have a very different approach, right, to, to how we're understanding communities when we think about sustainable communities, um, but also sovereign communities, right? So when we, when the sort of holistic approach makes sense, you know, how, do you, how are you engaging folks at every level, right? And so that was sort of what we did in, in, in Ithaca um, when we, had, we knew we had the vegetable program for the young kids, and then we also had cooking classes for the, for the, um, for the, for the um, older older folks, but then also gardening and growing for teenagers, right? And so seeing sort of like that whole, like how are we, how are we getting everyone and every, and then offering like food boxes and snack boxes like Greens Grow does, you know, for the family to take home. Because when kids get the, the vegetable at, the, at, the, at school, then they're like, oh, mom, I want, you know, kale at home. Which, you know, mom's like, what's kale? So then she, <laughs> so, so then they have an opportunity through their community center, right, at there to be able to purchase these things that the children are talking about. And then we also have people in our community who do shopping, who do shopping, um, uh, who do shopping work, right? I don't really know what it's called, but they take folks out to, and I, the, the, the food folks, the food folks do that before, when they take folks out to grocery stores and sort of, yeah, community educators and teach them sort of well, how to sort of go through the grocery aisles, right? Like, you know, so that you don't really need to go down the snack aisle, you know, run the perimeter, right? So really, a lot of times it's also about breaking habits, right? So what are the habit things that we, the things that we just do naturally without thinking about, because we've been doing it forever. And so we're thinking about how do we approach all of those levels, like all of those things, in a, in a very different way than like, what is the policy that can inform that, right? Um, and so I just want to bring that back to make sure that we, you know, are understanding that, that that's the, you know, a little difference between sort of how we're doing things in urban agriculture as, as opposed to like a larger organizational um, issues or, or ways of remedies that we're seeing. So I know we only have a few more minutes left, about five, and I was going to, yes. Question, but I also wanted to give anyone an opportunity who has something to share that this room would benefit from. I would love to have an opportunity for that as well. Sure. So this question may actually go into that. Um, understanding that just success is defined differently, and our current system is very capitalistic. But what is the what's the after for the kids that you have in each of your programs? How do we get more people of color to own restaurants or be <coughs> chefs or? Uh, leaders in these industries, what is that next intermediary step and what programs exist out in Philadelphia to put them into this? Great question. And it's a, it's a question that's on a lot of people's minds and a lot of people in a lot of conversations across the nation actually with these urban agricultural programs that we have, we have young people. Here in Philadelphia, um, we, um, there is nothing. No, I'm just kidding. So, we have, <laughs> so, you know, we have the whole, um, Greenworks, um, thing that's happening with workforce, with workforce development, and so there are conversations that are being had now, like, so how do we fold in, you know, how do we fold in our young people and who are in this urban act specifically, and because, you know, they just sort of, there's just, Urban, everyone's not familiar, like, so folks who are doing work at the city level are not all familiar with what's happening in our urban agriculture organizations. So we are pushing our, sort of pushing our way into the conversation so they know that we have these young people who, who can utilize this money or who can utilize this training in a way so we can forward this thing, right? And so um, just recently, we had some, there was some conversation with Power, with the um, religious organization that um, the, the, you know campaigning around the city with regards to the workforce development and, and how do we fold agriculture into that as well and also on the state level we, um, one of the issues that had come up with the, the last two years um, our state um, our state department is finally recognizing that urban, urban agriculture is a thing and, um, and and so we have created this urban ag working group um, through the state and one of the things that came up last year when they did tours of our young people they, did tip, they came around and did tours of the farms and they were talking to the young people about like the jobs available in agriculture, right? And then they were like trucking. 
checking in traditional ag for traditional ag, right? And we're like, okay, we teach our kids sustainable ag, we teach our kids entrepreneurship, we teach our, you know, all these different things, and we push back. And we're like, yeah, no, that's not acceptable. And what they said was, you know what, there are no codes, there are no designated job codes in, in, urban, in, in agriculture for what's happening in urban ag. So now, um, we just actually had a meeting on Monday to talk about, okay, so what does that look like? What, how do we identify the jobs that are, are in urban agriculture? How do we get those into the ag description of jobs, right? So they can look at that as possible. So yeah, so there's a lot of conversation around that um, happening and hopefully we'll see some you know, some movement forward. There's also an initiative with um, Bartram Gardens and a few other, other farms in the city to um, to create a program, a pass through a program with, along with Community College, right? So Philadelphia Community College is working along with Urban Creators and Bartram Farm and some other farms around the city to um, right now probably with, um, with Bartram to have young people um, who are coming through our programs do some get college credit for the things that they're doing, but also once they get to, to, to community college, they'll be able to do fellowships at our school. And so we're you know how what does the ag track look like is really important. I mentioned earlier that Fox Chase program, which I don't really know a lot about. I'm learning more about it through the Urban Ag um, Initiative through the state. And, um, and it's because it's not, so I deal, I deal in communities of color, most, for the most part, that's, you know, who I'm, who, the population I'm working with, poor people. And so the, um, so the Fox Chase program doesn't seem like it's geared towards our community, so I'm not really sure, I haven't really heard a lot about it. And, um, but they have, in the Northeast, um, apparently an elementary and a junior high school and a high school that's fo focused directly on ag, or has an ag program as a part of it. And so they're, um, you know, so, so they're, from what I understand, their program is about that. It's like sort of funneling or giving young people the opportunity to, um, to, to think about, you know, agriculture in this way, continue to do it later on in life. So they're definitely in conversation, you know, where it's, and there are people working. And I, I'm a huge believer in the collective unconscious. So if I think I have a thought that's like pretty unique, then I absolutely know someone else is having it somewhere, right? And then someone else somewhere else might be moving on that idea already. And that makes me, and that gives me hope in thinking that these things that I think about will actually be a reality and can be a reality somewhere. So thanks for bringing that up. Is, um, is aging out of our farmers, right? Like on a large scale, and on the city scale, yeah. it's the same thing, right? So the same thing is happening with our, with our urban, with rural farmers are happening here. And so we're thinking about how do we match, right? Young people with the land, and, um, we're, and we're thinking about, you know, how do we um, how do we even hold that land? Because a lot of times those folks don't own that land, right? They've just been working on that land for a, for, for a long time. So is that land um, worthy of preservation? And, you know, that matters, that means that, 
decision has to be made based on who if the community is involved still, right? So it, you know, so so yeah, it's a tenuous situation. We, we're definitely you know trying to figure out how to make those matches happen. Um, and Soil Generation has been working on it for the last year, and I can say that we haven't come up with any real answers. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah.